Welcome to another moment in the Word. Have you noticed that too often times religion is about details? It's about the, the peculiarities of doing something in a certain way and forgetting oftentimes what it's all about and the purpose. To focus on, on the minutia of the law and, and forgetting what the law really is, that it's a pointer to Christ, a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Well, as we look now at the response of the priest, the chief priest to Judas Iscariot, we see that it's too much about religion and not enough about a relationship with God. We're in Matthew's gospel, we're in chapter 27, and we're looking and meditating on verses 6 to 8. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful to put them in the treasury because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel, and they bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood, even unto this day. The whole context is actually that Judas Iscariot, and we see it in verse 5, he came after being with the chief priest and asking for them to somehow or another take back the, the, the silver coins and, and that he has betrayed innocent blood and somehow or another reverse what he had started and they respond to his confession. What is that to us? He now is totally with his guilt and nothing to do with his guilt. He's feeling that there is no value to confess to them. No, they leave him with his guilt. He is angry. He is angry with God. He is angry with religion. He goes then from them to the temple. He goes into the nous, is the Greek word. We get our English word nave from it. He goes into the temple proper, some place that he would be actually prohibited to go into, but he's gone in. Why? He is angry with God. He takes those 30 pieces of silver, the price of a female slave, and he throws them, hurls them onto the marble floor. And you can imagine the coins, all 30 of them, rolling all over the place. And then he leaves. He departs. He's alone. And he goes and he hangs himself. And as he hangs himself, at the same time, we have the chief priests. And notice it's the chief priest. We know that there is actually three that are involved in this whole process up until now. There had been the chief priest that we find in verse 1. There had been the elders of the people. And previously, there were the scribes. All three of them are involved. But the scribes aren't involved in verse 1 because we really don't want the experts of the law to be telling us how to be handling Jesus. And now we find it's only the priests. Why? Why not the elders? Oh, because who's responsible for the temple? So the chief priests are the ones that are called upon and they then have a problem. Judas has created for them a problem. And that is that they now has an abomination in their temple. Because we find in Deuteronomy that if we have, Deuteronomy 23 verse 8, that if we have the wage of a harlot, or the price of a dog, it could not be accepted as a gift, as an offering in the temple. It wouldn't be acceptable. It was considered an abomination unto the Lord. And if that's the case, then, then the blood money that we have when they had hired Judas to betray Jesus now is an abomination. That abomination is now in their worship. But they're the ones that paid the money. 
Where did the money come from? It came from the temple. Isn't it interesting how we can be so picky unish about certain parts of the law and yet overlook the grander, the more important things of the law? That's actually what Jesus had said earlier in Matthew chapter 23. He said, Woe to you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! You pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin, and you omit the weightier parts of the law, which is justice and mercy and faith. Really, what God has called us to is a relationship. Not a relationship to, to the letter of the law, but he has called us to a relationship by the Spirit, which the law is to bring us to Christ, to bring us to a relationship with him. And why Christ? Because Jesus is God who has become man. And I don't understand God. He is holy. He is spirit. And therefore, for I need flesh. I need God who has put on my flesh, tabernacled with me to behold his glory. And that's what has happened. And Jesus now pays the price for my sin through his blood. And in reality, these priests have paid for that blood. Now notice how this goes. And the chief priests, they took the silver pieces. Silver is always an, a picture, a symbol of redemption. We see that in the tabernacle in the wilderness, and we'll see it all through Scripture. But they take now the silver pieces, and they say it is not lawful. And that word lawful has the idea it's not permissible. It, it, it is certainly not authoritative, because they have something that's an abomination, and now they have to figure out what to do with it. And so they're admitting their own guilt because they say, because it is the price of blood. Well, who paid the price? They did. They're actually making an admission. And what they don't realize is that blood, according to Leviticus, is where the life is. What they did is they bought the life of God offered to them, to us, and they paid for it. And they paid for it through silver. Peter says, we're not redeemed by the things of silver and gold. No, that we got from the vain traditions of our fathers. Oh, no but by the precious blood of the Lamb. Life is in the blood. The life of Christ is the life of God. That is attested by his resurrection. He can't remain in the grave, not like you and me. No, he rises from the grave because he is eternal. He is God. And because of your confession of your own sin, you then identify with Christ, and that gives you then eternal life. So then what are they going to do with this? They take counsel. Again and again, we find them taking counsel, and now they're taking counsel. What do we do with this money? And so they decide that they're going to buy potter's field. Well, what is a potter? A potter is one who works with clay. Isn't that what God is? Isn't he the potter? Aren't we the clay? And, and what does the potter do? Well, he, he over and over will fashion and, and, and mold the clay. And sometimes it's on a throwing wheel. And, and you'll wonder in your own life, why is it that we seem to be going in cycles and circles and it seems to repeat the events again and again? But I want to remind you that the work is actually not on the outside of the vessel, but instead the potter puts his hand on the inside and the real pressure is on the inside pushing. And that's what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. He is working from the inside out. But notice that that potter's field has been called 
the field of blood. And again, the field of blood, that is the place of life. Isn't it so interesting that Jesus would have died in this place? He would have been placed in this very field, except for Joseph of Arimathea, that God had raised up and put into the heart of Joseph of Arimathea, a rich man who had a grave that had never been used for Jesus to be laid in, and that he and Nicodemus prepared the body and put it in there. And God has been working in preparing you. But notice the next verse. It says that wherefore that field is called the field of blood even unto this day. But I want to encourage you. That field of blood, which seems to be now something that was an abomination. Jesus has taken that and maybe you feel like an abomination and maybe what you have done is an abomination. But God gives you life if you trust in him. And the very blood that was purchased through Judas's betrayal is what gives you life. And not only life, but cleanses you of that abomination. Let's pray. Thank you so much, Father, for your word and for the encouragement that it brings to us and the change that happens in us and the work as you, the potter, working in us, moving out the stony parts and working from within to fashion us and to mold us into the likeness of your dear Son, the Lord Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen.